Does that work? Does that work for you? That works for me, yes. Okay, great. Excellent. Well, I'm ready to go. All right. Let's do it then. Great. So I'm going to just go through an account of about nine different ways that we focus on improving wildlife habitat here. Um, some really brief and some quite more, quite a bit more involved, and then uh, about how we enhance the habitat. And then I'll just say a word on harvestability at the end. In five years, I might have a slideshow on harvestability, but we're just at the beginning of, of focusing on that part of it because we've only been enhancing um, habitat for five to ten years, and you know that's still the beginning. So we'll have more to say on that in the future. So primarily when you want when you start off you want to ask yourself some of these questions as you're overarching you know strategizing uh, going into it. So prim you know what are your limiting factors to wildlife needs on site and when are they? Um, generally food, water, cover, space, movement and a synergy of all of those together are the main components of wildlife habitat. Um, but you may have other, considerations that are specific to your site as well, such as um, lack of disturbance might be one if you're in an area where there's a lot of wildlife disturbance, then, you know, space could be uh, construed as like lack of disturbance and, and creating like kind of refuge areas. So that's just a general overview. Um, for us on this site, um, they're primarily food, specifically in the form of winter food that's available in the winter and water that's available in the winter. Those are the biggest limiting factors to, to especially deer and turkey that are our target species here, um, but to other animals as well, certainly to, to a lot of predators. Um, and um, as well, you want to identify points of maximum leverage to improve these. So how can you actually you know, go at these with the, the least amount of effort for the maximum amount of result? And then you want to, you know, get going, start in and observe and interact as you go and um, tweak, your, tweak your actions based on what you see happening. Um, so our, an overview of some of the area of the site we're working on is on these two maps. One's an aerial and one is a, um, an old contour map. Not terribly accurate. Some of these strategies happen in other places, but I just wanted to give a, a spatial layout of where uh, of where they go on. And we're working over about forty to fifty acres in a in a in some way, and really especially on about twenty to twenty five acres uh, uh, where we're applying these nine strategies. So the first one is water everywhere, just improving the water you know, the hydrology of a site, increasing the amount of water available and when it's available, especially when things are frozen up in the winter. Um, and also when they're really dry in the summer. Um, for a lot of people, they're going to be in a much drier place than I happen to live in in Vermont. So that's going to be a big when as far as leverage points goes is, is dry season. Um, orchard renovation and grafting in situ plants, pollinate, pollinator promotion, patch cutting and planting in those patches, growing wild rice and potentially other wetland crops. Um, just straight up forest management, which for us means mass tree release and also dropping slash to the ground so deer can eat the, the buds when there's very scarce food in the winter. Uh, fruit and just planting fruit and fruit nut trees uh, where there were none. And cultivating intentional food plots, which is a very commonly known strategy. And vegetable gardening, which is an unintentional uh, way to improve wildlife habitat. So water everywhere. Um, for us, that really means adding and extending uh, both year-round and seasonal water uh, in the form of ponds, springs, paddies, vernal pools, and just recharging groundwater everywhere as a result of, of doing regenerative water work on site. So... Uh, as far as how to regenerate water systems, I have whole presentations on that. I won't get right into that here. A lot of my presentations start with a slide like this, but the idea being slow it, spread it, and sink water on site. So don't let water run off. Let it go in. This is just a diagram of, sw of, of two swales, which is an on-contour uh, ditch, basically. So water has to 
stop and settle into the slope uh, when you make one of these. Um, I'm not recommending that everyone swale everywhere on their site. Uh, it's oftentimes an overdone um, strategy in the permaculture world, but uh, slowing, spreading, and sinking water is incredibly important on arguably any site, and swales are a very easy way to do that. Uh, ponds are another way to do that. Smart layout of roads is another. Um, making vernal pools can be one. Making um, patties can be another. So any way you can slow, spread, and sink water is, is a win for not only your site uh, regeneration, uh, overall ecosystem health, but certainly wildlife habitat as a result. Because of course, wildlife habitat, the quality of wildlife habitat is tied to the quality of the ecosystem on the site as a whole. So really I want to just start with saying ecosystem regeneration is wildlife habitat, is growing wildlife uh, to begin with. That's an important, you know, net to cast right at the beginning here. Um, for us on our original site, this is just one good example of, of, of part of the site and how that's looked. We, ha we happen to grow rice there um, for a number of years and also make a bunch of ponds. Um, we've developed springs on a whole bunch of sites. This is one going in on a friend's property uh, this spring. And uh, here's a spring that we developed a few years ago on our second site, and we just ran it to the road um, actually very recently uh, with the help of a neighbor who brought the big quarried stone in. And now this is a public access spring. Um, here's a good example of land change to, to bring in more water, to hold more water and make it available. So here's two ponds going in, a site that really wasn't all that wet to begin with. But you, know, you can see it's it's not... It's not a wetland, um, and it's a very sloping site. But you know, you kind of if you build it, it will come. It is very uh, true for water in a lot of ways. Um, and that so, didn't even seem like an area that you'd normally put a pond. You know, it's a it's a it's it's not on a ridge, but it's a very mild valley. But it's not a deep valley. So yeah, sure. in in that way, I think if what you if what you're saying is you know normally you see a pond as a very wet area or in a pretty defined yeah. valley. Yeah, this is a pretty, um, you know, minor valley. Yeah. But it's enough of one, you know, to, yeah. to work quite well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, all of the habitat that can be developed around these pond systems, of course, is can be incredibly diverse. It can be buffered from a microclimate perspective. It can be beautiful for people and can be, um, you know, incredibly valuable for wildlife. So this is all our original site. And then our, our second site that we manage is this, and there's an aerial uh, looking north. Um, there were large ponds on site, and then we also added a couple. And we've been grazing it, as you can see the herd here. And we planted 7,000 feet of, of woody, you know, mostly food-based hedgerows, nut and, and uh, plant, uh, nut and fruit plants. Um, you can see the lines here. And berry crops as well. That's what these lines are closer in the foreground. This is five years ago, so these are quite quite further along now. Or maybe, yeah, this is four years ago. Um, I have a diagram here from our book, which just explains this concept pretty well. I won't read it all off, but that primarily it does say a lot. So I would I would reference this page in, in my book, uh, which I have a, a photo of at the end for people who are interested in finding out more. But the idea here of just holding water on the landscape and moving it around from where it's in excess to where it's in a dearth, where, where there's not enough, and also moving fertility around that way as well. Because when you're moving water, you can move fertility around really well. Water is a, you know, universal solvent and it's always, it's often as moving way more fertility than we want it to. So if we can move it along contour or close to contour and deliver fertility where there's not enough, then we can really spread out that abundance and, and absorb it too into the land before it ends up in the river where we don't want fertility. Obviously, the ponds become a great space for people. This is in, a, in a, one of our permaculture courses on our original site. There's a, one of our uh, series of rice paddies. Um, these are just intentional wetlands. So great way of recharging groundwater. Fantastic. And they can be turned into terraces over time if you'd rather do have like a dry land terrace. Um, but for us, we, we grew rice in them for a while. Frogs and, and other amphibians um, benefit very 
quickly and very directly. Um, one of the things when you start making ponds in a landscape is the soundscape, the, the rate of soundscape change is just massive. You go from like a quiet site to at night, just stereo surround sound, you know, blaring frogscape, which is pretty cool. I know some people maybe don't love it, but with the frogs and toads, we love to listen to. Yeah, and, it helps you sleep, I feel. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. And it's, you know, it's part of the sound of, of, re, of regeneration. I mean, m the the world as a whole is, is dehydrated today. So uh -huh. it's safe to say wherever you live, there's been massive amounts of wetlands filled, you know, drained and filled. Um, there was way more um, pond and wetland habitat all over the world. And certainly the United States, where I live, where you live, where most people are watching this from. Um, so these soundscapes are, you know, used to be around everywhere too. So it's kind of interesting to think about. I mean, the area in the U.S. alone that was um, standing water because of the activity of beavers, I was reading in the last year or two, was something like the size of Delaware, just from beaver impoundments alone was, I, I think it was at least as the size of Delaware in just the United States. And so, you know, massive amounts of water being held in the landscape just through the way nature has evolved. And we've, you know, undone that in a massive way. So um, really, really important to remember that. We can't bring back, you know, soil without bringing back the water system. We can't bring back wildlife without bringing back the water system. When we make ponds, we want to take care to make them with a lot of complexity. So not just digging a, a you know, a conical shaped hole in the ground, but to have a lot of varied edges where you can promote plants on the edges. Um, we call them planting shelves, you know, having boulders in the bottom, having a lot of habitat around them, plants and trees around the ponds, et cetera, yeah, my et cetera. Parents, my my, my uh, in-laws, my yeah, they put in a pond a year ago, and it's basically a big hole in the ground. And, you know, when I came over and I was, like, watching them build it, I was like, well, you guys going to put some planting shelves in and, you know, some, some habitat and nope. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 it's the common and, and way I, it's done is people, you know, just dig a big steep walled hole and then they mow and then they, you know, add insult to injury by just mowing to the edges continuously. The edge. Oh, man, even, <laughs> even worse. Yeah, it's just such an opportunity missed, and it's um, yeah, yeah, it's just sad. I mean, it's a, it's a you know, it's kind of a a. Um... Well, they're constantly buying feeder fish too for their bass. Oh wow! Which they wouldn't have to do if they had built proper ecology in the sure. Forest. Yeah, yeah, we like to make it hard on ourselves. I think all with a, a particular aesthetic in mind that needs to evolve, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, sooner than it is. Yeah, I see that all over. And I'm always, you know, on client sites saying, well, the one easy way to improve the health of this pond is stop mowing to the edge everywhere and, you know, let those edges develop and promote plant, you know, wetland plants at the edges. Um, they will heal themselves, you know, oftentimes. But, um, yeah, very quickly, too. Yeah, yeah, they can for sure. Um so second part here, uh, you know, water overarching um, is orchard renovation and grafting trees, uh, woody plants that are already located in the space in situ. And for us, the biggest way we do that is to graft existing apples because apples are seedling all over the property. There's all these feral volunteer apples. And I've found over the years that turkeys love these um, ornamental crabs. There's different names, cultivars in the nursery trade for these ornamental crabs. But basically, they're these little apples. And they, the amazing thing is that they fruit every year. Unlike the, the wild apples, you know, the, and, and unlike uh, cultivated varieties of, of eating apples for people that are unreliable generally, you know, all over the country due to late frost, especially yeah. these fruit every single year. I've never seen them not fruit in like plaza parking lots, you know, where I'm familiar with them. They're constant, incredibly resilient and reliable. And, um, they hold their fruit all winter. So those two characteristics of hold the fruit all winter and fruit set every year is just phenomenal. And then the, they're great size for turkeys to eat. So they're winter, just winter, you know, buffets for turkeys. And I've seen, you know, more than two dozen turkeys in some of these trees. 
So I started gra actually taking cuttings of these trees, you know, ones in my local food co-op. I, I just would always have pruners in my car and I would in dormant season just, you know, just take some scions that they were going to, they'd want to prune anyways, stuff that grew too much or is in your way when you're walking under them that they, that you know, they're going to take off. And I started grafting these onto, um, apples, um, on our property and I'll just show so these are the turkey apple here's turkey apple cyan this is with a group of our interns and um, then we graft it on to the existing turkey existing wild apples this happens to be a Siberian pear it's just a photo okay. of, of whip and tongue gra whip and tongue grafting is what we do generally that happens to if you know apples and pears anyone watching they might see oh that doesn't look like an apple it's not it's a pear but same thing for the apples and then inside of two years, this is what it looks like. Wow. Immediate fruit set. I mean, these things are incredibly precocious, and you're also tapping into an existing root system. Uh -huh. So you could see in this photo all of this kind of marginal edge, which never made good hay because it's essentially a sloping wetland. We have about four acres of it. It's considered wasteland by most farmers, these you know, kind of wetland edges. And it's part of what I think Aldo Leopold would have called remises, which are just kind of um, these neglected areas and edges of farm, of, of crop areas, of fields that you might crop or, or do for hay or pasture, and not really an intentional space that you can turn into a very high value space, either for food or for cover, is what Aldo yeah. Leopold mostly, I think, focused on in this in his Midwestern work. Um, but for us, we realized when we stopped brush hog, we had the guy who used to brush hog this, these marginal areas stop brush hogging them. I'm not really sure why he brush hogged them. I mean, I guess because probably he didn't want them to come to a forest and you'd have a lot of work to do it if you waited, you know, if you didn't brush hog at least once every year or two, then you'd have stuff you couldn't cut with a mower. Yeah. So we let it go and we realized after two years these four to five acres are just hundreds of wild apples. And we said to ourselves, well, sure, let's have four to five acres of apple orchard. That would be nice. Thanks, we don't have to plant any of them. And so we started grafting these with not only turkey apples, but dry cider varieties and all sorts of other, you know, good eating apples for people. But there's so much space and we have so many apples already that really turning this into a, 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 a hem... A, a turkey and deer feeding extravaganza seemed to make all the sense in the world. And also a great, you know, turkey game, you know, game preserve <laughs> for hunting. Yeah. So we've got maybe 250 of these turkey apples now strewn out from about 300, 200 yards behind me in this photo to another 400 yards past me in this photo, all through these wetland edges. Uh -huh. And we started to feed the trees a little bit with some fer you know, fertilizer or manure pee on them, and bowl protect them so they would actually survive in this very kind of feral situation. Uh -huh. And now they're just raging up. So um, we also, you know, rehab existing older apple trees, which is a great way of getting a yield really quickly. Um, so that's what we're doing in this photo. Um, we collect cyan wood from all over, you know, whether it's a beautiful wild tree that we've seen or a tree in someone's yard that seems to be bearing really well or cyan wood exchanges, you know, people who are trading cyan wood where you can just, you know, give and take cyan wood for free. Or you can buy cyan wood, which I do from Fedco sometimes. Uh, never travel without your pruners in your car because you're going to come across cyan wood, you know, all winter long. Try to remember what trees are great, you know, in the growing season and go back there in the winter. Um, so yeah, sometimes we'll do rind grafts like this. Um, this looks like a pear being grafted. Um, yeah, so that that covers that section. Um, pollinator plantings, just emphasizing, you know, all of the, you know, both wild and potentially, you know, European honeybee honeybee pollinators you may have on site. Uh, for us, we really focus on herbaceous perennials because they're just almost no maintenance, essentially. Um, they're one of the only plants that I could say that for. And um, also, there's a lot of value to just benign neglect, you know, to timed mowings and time disturbances um, and to kind of varying that so you have a rolling source of nectar going out, roll out throughout the summer into the fall. 
Um, and that can be, honestly, it's very easy to just do random mowings timing-wise, and you, you'll, you'll immediately start to see some benefit from that if you're managing an area of field or, or kind of wet meadow or, uh, you know, marginal. Uh, when I say field, I mean, some people may think, well, I, I hay my field and I, I pasture it, so I, I can't just do that. That's true, but a lot of, especially larger sections of field, always have, like, these very marginal edges where usually you can do this with a lot of success. Um, for every good field, there's as much, you know, poor field, you know, usually connected to it sometimes, uh, where we can do a ton for wildlife. Um, not, not in all parts of the country, but here that's the case. There's a lot of just neglected kind of old, what we call old field. Um, so we also plant, you know, habitat directly. This actually isn't a perennial. It's kind of a self-seeding annual. This is Anis hyssop, but also echinacea and, um, we have motherwort here, which some people consider a, a huge weed, but we like to see it spread a bit on its own because it's an incredible uh, pollinator refuge and pollinator food source. Uh, Baptisia australis is this plant in the foreground. It's a nitrogen-fixing herbaceous perennial that just blasts apart soil, does amazing work uh, in decompaction. Um, so they're really, all uh, herbaceous perennials seem very strong for that in general, soil decompaction. Um, some also annuals like um, Tithonia, uh, Mexican sunflower. You know, one little Mexican sunflower seed like this makes hundreds of these flowers uh, and then thousands of more seeds. Um, we establish the herbaceous perennials in beds like this. We'll, I'll BCS um, two-wheel drive tractor, till them in the summer, cover crop. This is the best way to do it. I don't always, not always ahead of um, the game enough to do this, but when I am, it works really well. You till in the summer, cover crop it with like a deer feeding or uh, food crop like turnip and radish and clover mixed up. And then you till it again. Then they eat it all winter, digging up the roots and manuring it all. So the regeneration has started after that disturbance. And then till it or not again in the spring. I say till it if it still seems to be a bunch of grass. And uh, this is a pond berm, as you can see. And then yeah. we sow in divided um, echinacea, bee balm, coreopsis, whatever we have that we want to divide and sow in. Um, uh, lupin, although lupin's often from seed for us so far. Yeah. And then you sow it in like this. And by late summer, this is just a hallway of, of herbaceous perennial flowers, just wow. walls. And even on a pond berm, I mean, this is an intentionally compacted crap soil and uh it'll it'll go you know for a lot of these herbaceous perennials they're super tough you know most of them with for the, on the benign neglect we see amazing results on the um for the monarch especially and other um a animals that partake of the uh, milkweed and so yep. we've just kind of allowed the milkweed to come up in certain places and and kind of time mowing from like twice a year to once a year to once every two years to once every three years and kind of have a really random variable pattern in, in brush hogging and that can lead to incredible um, uh, milkweed yields and we've seen the monarch po we've seen you know a lot of results with that I, I think the monarch population is rebounding I'm, I'm hearing at least this year it was amazing yeah. here I don't know. Was it like that where you are? Were there a lot more monarchs this year? There was. I mean, my mother-in-law is actually really into it. So she had, you know, multiple little boxes and stuff where she was putting them in. Um, cool. It seemed just like so many more than normal. Yeah. Yeah, I heard, I think, I heard their wintering conditions were better or something in the last couple of years. And so we yeah. felt that up here. Um, again, with the benign neglect, you know, getting, and, and, mow, and time mowing, you can get, um, goldenrod, you know, a month later than, than goldenrod would normally flower if you hit it in June with the mower. Because then that stuff gets stunted and it flowers after the goldenrod that didn't get mowed would flower. So then you're extending that pollen season. Um, goldenrod in general is quite a weed for us. I mean, it's funny, people don't call it invasive because it's quote unquote native, but I mean, it's it, more invasive than so many plants that people like to call invasive. Um, now that I keep bees, I, I don't really mind so much, but it, it really does take over fields very, very quickly. Um, echinacea is another good example of what we grow. Um, cardinal, uh, cardinal flower, you know, lobelia, 
Um, bee balm, bee balm will flower for a very long period of time, which is helpful, and it's about as tough as they come. Um, there's a lot of other other uh, plants we focus on too, but those are the main ones. Um, this should be in the woody crops section, <laughs> but it got left in that section. So um, moving on from pollinators, we have patch cutting and replanting those patches that we're clearing, forest clearings, uh, to grow a new crop of trees. Um, that is both for us and for wildlife. Masting mainly nut trees, sometimes fruit trees. Um, so we've done about four and a half acres of, of just straight up clearing of existing forest. Some I've just dropped myself in the winter with a chainsaw and left all the material as you can see in this photo. And despite my forester thinking this was crazy, just did it you know he's he said well you know you ever see a blowdown you you won't be able to get in there and and we we could get in there i dropped them all luckily very parallel uh yeah. well not not just luckily but by intention and it was difficult but you can see all the people in here we were able to climb into this area and plant uh bare root trees which is pretty much how we always plant trees basically how we always plant trees um yeah. Oaks and walnuts and black locust is our typical mix and uh, find nice places for them. The great thing about the, all these trees on the ground, one of them is it keeps deer away. Not that we have very many deer, but we do have some. And yeah. it's also, you know, in this case, about 100,000 pounds of biomass. It's just going right back to the soil for the most part. Yeah. So all that biomass is kept on site. We've also done the full Mordor variety which is a feller buncher and you know like a tree chipping job because that was a way of clearing about three acres that we just couldn't clear by hand and also it would have been hard to plant all of it because when you do drop everything you can't really get into some of it and so trees will come up um but you can really get at it all when you do it this way now, is it more destructive in the beginning? For sure. I mean, that's kind of a bit of a wasteland at first. But in our climate, amazingly, this comes back. I would not do this in drier, more brittle climates. I would keep all your wood on site. Now, important to mention, some people may be wondering, why are you dropping all these trees? Why are you clearing existing forests? Like, isn't that what we're, what we're going for? In these, both of these situations, these were monocultures of red and white pine. They were plantation. And for us, there's... We have other plantations of red and white pine that we're not clearing. Um, and these were overstocked and never thinned when they should have been like 15, 20 years ago. So they weren't even a marketable timber size. So for us, dropping these to the ground is to accelerate a whole nother succession, which is way more valuable for us and for wildlife and for soil than just letting this kind of stagnant, you know, red pine plantation just kind of fall in on itself over the next 20 years. And also, as it falls in on itself, it damages the trees that were there that are starting to get grow. So if you drop it all at once, then you can have that new succession grow without it constantly being bombarded by trees. Exactly, yeah. This red pine stand was just breaking halfway up, you know, in windstorms. So that was that made the decision easy. After a few years of contemplating it, okay, let's just drop it all and make like a full blowdown simulation and replant it immediately. This one is getting quite dominated by the existing sugar maple, which were there. So we may or may not get some oaks and walnuts and locust out of it. We may get some, but still sugar maple is a win for the situation, for sure. Yeah. We knew that going into it. In this site, there was a lot less in the understory. And the oaks and walnuts and black locust that we planted here are pretty much going to make the canopy um, in, yeah. in a lot of it. So, and even if it's half comprised of five types of oaks here, for us, there's almost no oaks around here. That's a total massive leverage point in the ecosystem in this part of the world uh, to add white oak and red oak. Uh, red exists a little bit, white not at all, but we've got a few types of white oak we're putting in, swamp, burr, um, chestnut oak, and there's one other I'm blanking on right now, um, as well as red oak, um, black walnut. And black locust uh, black locust in kind of the roughest areas because they're yeah. they're really really tough um and then you can plant this uh oh i have i have a photo of the tools about how to get this stuff planted in, in a in a little bit uh, 
So moving on from patch cutting and replanting wild rice and growing other stuff in wetlands, um, we emphasize, you know, wild rice, which is a perennial carbohydrate, which is fantastic for wildlife, uh, wildlife. But um, we also are growing it for ourselves. You know, like all these strategies have benefits basically for us too, even if we weren't aiming to harvest some wildlife. Um, this is one where the yield, you know, for us is very, very direct, but it also can be great for wildlife. Um, so there we're out kind of harvesting and knocking the wild rice back into the, into the water. And uh, we're in only year three, really, of this, so we're really knocking most of it back in to get a really dense stand going, and then we'll start harvesting more for ourselves over time. But our goal is to have a family worth of wild rice, and to have a place from which the wild rice will be brought to other ponds and be part of the whole neighborhood and, and regional food system, because it's not really at all in the mountains of Vermont. A friend of ours brought it here from Maine. And it, it's taken very well in ponds at about one to five feet deep. Uh, and usually it grows well only in like riverine edges. And But this is a true pond, not a riverine situation. And it seems to be doing pretty darn well. Yeah, I didn't expect that because that's not really where it grows, you know, and it's more, yeah. nati more native habitat. Um, so um, releasing mass trees in our forest management activities and dropping slash to the ground as, you know, buds f for immediate food for the deer herd and also um, long-term fruits and nuts um, that come off of the existing trees that are there. So this is more of a silviculture approach because we're not really, this strategy doesn't have us planting anything. It's just kind of thinning, more of yeah. a typical forestry approach. Um, so there's a, there's deer eating red maple. I set up my game cam on, on some of it, uh, a few years ago when I started, um, doing, when I, after I'd been doing this for a few years, I wanted to see it, you know, what it looked like, you know, yeah. on the game cam and they were, you know, they just mobbed these things. You can see the, the tail of it in tracks, but it's nice to see a photo. Yeah. Um, and that's the only photo I have for this because it's otherwise it's basically chainsaw work. So, yeah. you know, that's kind of the visual is, is, is the slash on the ground and, you know, dropping trees with chainsaws. And then the rest of the tree you're going to use for firewood normally? Yeah. So then we harvest the bowl, you know, the trunk of the tree, I pull for firewood most of the time, not always. Um, and the slash we leave on the ground for, for food and biomass. Yeah, and I'm, I'm releasing mostly black cherry in this situation. There's about five acres over which there's a good bit of cherry coming in, and I'm releasing the cherry by reducing the red maple that's out-competing it. And we actually got a, a bunch of years ago part of a WIP grant, like Wildlife Habitat Improvement NRCS grant, to cut some of these red maple back to promote the cherry. Because they just, you know, realize the wildlife value of that. Yeah. And it'd be nice to have the cherry for millable lumber down the road. Um, it's not amazing cherry. You know, we're in the mountains of Vermont. But, you know, anyone in Pennsylvania would laugh at it as far as being good cherry or places where cherry really grows well. But, it, it you know, it's, yeah. it's there and some of it's pretty straight and not too defective. Yeah. Um, it also has a lot of burl wood on it. And I like bull turning. And so that's kind of neat too a little bit of like a bowl bowl a burrow wood farm so to speak yeah uh so probably the biggest area we've worked with is in planting fruit and nut trees where they weren't you know where they didn't exist and also promoting the feral volunteers which i talked about a bit already um this is just a photo of a, a crop of a of a um turkey wild turkey that I harvested a bunch of years ago is just filled with um, with uh, Japanese barberry. So people are always hating on, you know, some of these really successful wild, you know, feral um, plants. And they're incredible food sources, you know, all yeah. of the time. Um, we just don't like to acknowledge it oftentimes because we're attached to these, like, static versions yeah. of what we think the ecosystem should be. And uh, I just couldn't believe, you know... The, the turkeys are just living on these uh, Japanese barberry. And they're also benefiting from the grazing in this valley 
we're fortunate to have one big grazer who really hits the, the valley pretty hard as a whole and opens up a lot of edges that wouldn't be able to support as much wildlife as it does because of that. Yeah. Grazing is a 10 strategy that I could have featured in the slideshow, but I just didn't for, spa for space needs. But you, can, you could look at the right way, certain ways of grazing as definitely improving wildlife. And that's, that's important to remember, sometimes massively so. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons a lot of people say the deer, the deer habitat is so bad in a lot of Vermont now is because there's so little field and there's so little um, agriculture and especially grazing agriculture to keep land open, which offers a lot of benefit for other grazing animals like deer. Um, there's not a lot of food when it's only in the canopy. You know, bear and turkey... Uh, do well then, and, and those are doing well here, but deer don't do well at all with that. They, they can't yeah. climb trees and get to the buds, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. so uh, disturbance becomes really key. Um, walnuts are a huge piece of leverage besides oaks in this part of the world because they will thrive, but they're not here, and we have some good varieties we've been working with over the years to actually breed them. Uh, we're like 15 years into our first walnut planting that's now been bearing for about five plus years and we're selecting the best nuts from that you can see the nut meat is yeah. really big and extractable on this and then we're planting right. those so we yeah. put them in buckets the whole name of the game is protecting them from from rodents overwinter them in a root cellar or in a kind of warm pocket of a really good greenhouse like a glass house that won't freeze too deeply yeah. and then grow them up you can grow you know a whole an acre of trees in a bucket like this we bare root them then after the first year in pots. And then, you know, you can actually bare root right in a pile of snow very well as far as storage. So that's, this is actually, it's this and then this. So you go from this, uh, okay, yep, yep, you go from yep. this to this to this, yep. and then gotcha. you plant them out. Nice. Now we plant them out. This is actually, they're twice as big as this or three times when we plant them out. This is how we plant them from when we plant a seed directly in the ground. Okay. So that right. little walnut in there, you can see is about 18 inches high, is planted as a seed. That's something we just started experimenting with in the last few years. Gotcha. And you have to make these cages to do that. And you have to bury the cages quite a bit down in the ground to keep the rodents out of it. It's And the only reason it doesn't work is when rodents get it. But that pretty much will undo yeah. this a lot of the time, even with the cages, but we found it works pretty good. If you have a bunch of cats around and your rodent population's knocked back a bit, it, this is even more successful. Gotcha. Then I pulled the cage in like probably, this is probably July, and then I'll just store the cages and reuse them year, and we'll do this every year now. And uh, if I remember to, hopefully I'll, I'll definitely stake these and mulch them really well for the first year or two to get them up. Because so many trees fail. Because you just, they get stepped on or mowed in the first few years. you got to mark them well. If you're pl yeah. and most of the time I say, if you plant a tree, you know, put a four to six foot fiberglass marker right next to that tree. Because it, it's just so easy to have it go to waste if you don't yeah. know it's there. Yeah, like a driveway marker or something. Yeah, lowcostmarkers.com mar surprisingly has these very low cost markers. And they're <laughs> quarter inch little fiber posts. I've used them for years now, these blue ones. Three foot, I usually see, even in the jungle in the summer, and I get blue, so I see them, but they're not super, super kind of offensive and just like really, really yeah. visible. And and they work well. It's been a really good investment in getting trees up, as well as having burlap, because that's a just quick mulch. Yeah, um, yeah. Much better than, much easier than get, in getting weed suppression than with wood chips alone. These um, highballer spades, and especially these A.M. Leonard planting bars you can just yep. get stuff in the ground super quick you don't need to dig holes for a lot of this stuff you can plant a thousand trees in a week or more with a few people by you know using planting bars rather than digging holes every time some planting spades help if you have to dig holes and if you're really giving the deluxe treatment you know um broad forks can be a great tree planting tool uh, but that's you know that's the 20 dollar hole for a one dollar tree and these are the the five cent hole for the 20 cent tree or the free tree, but that can be good enough uh, for a lot of plants. Yeah. Um, this is uh, my son went on during a walnut mission we made this fall. 
but we're big on the uh, big on the walnuts, and I'll collect them from trees that are both my the trees we have producing, and from ones we see in the in the general county that we're in. Yeah. And when I pass them, I'll just load up the car, and I'll even if they're nuts that aren't amazing nut meats that I don't want to invest in in the long haul for myself, I bring them to areas where they're no one's gonna plant them, and I just dump them at high elevations where the rodents can plant them for me. And so I brought this bag of walnuts to the highest elevation series of fields in basically our watershed and just said, here you go, squirrels, and, you know, probably come back in 5, 10, 20 years, and there'll be some walnuts in this area that then keep spreading from there. So it's like gravity feeding, you know, whole watersheds with valuable tree crops just by bringing, being the squirrel in terms of dispersion and bringing those nuts uphill to the most strategic areas mm -hmm. really high leverage point for us in, in this part of the world um, because they just don't exist here unless they're planted the walnuts but they'll totally thrive mm -hmm. we're having uh, success with chestnuts so far not quite as easy as oaks and walnuts but they're they're going um, I think the snow and ice will rip them apart over the years a bit more and I don't I'm not going to put as much stock in them but you know even if they kind of limp along here and there they're offering a whole nother type of yield yeah. Yeah. Um, more of a carbohydrate yield than the protein and fat yield but very valuable pears have been awesome for us here's some of our walnuts uh, 15 years in asian pears are incredibly precocious a really great way of getting like super fast large fruit great for okay. people of course awesome for people good for wildlife too this yeah. is Shinseki Asian pear. They'll bear grafted onto existing Asian pears inside of two years. And from bare root, they'll bear in three or four years. You know, very quick. Whereas a lot of uh, European pears actually take longer than apples usually. Um, but we also love them too. That's what yeah. these are. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then, of course, these all cross. There's a lot of crossing of lines here. But here's a fruit crop, but it's a pollinator crop too. You know, if it fruits, it flowers. So, yeah. you know, it, 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 you know, their pollinator can be fruit tree, et cetera, et cetera. They can be one and the same. This is a Korean bush cherry or um, Prunus tomentosa, Nanking cherry. Some people know these as. They're just super abundant. Every one of these flowers or most of them become this um, red fruit. And we grow a lot of berries as well of, of almost all types that we can and you know, the wildlife habitat just from having woodies come up in a field is valuable. Here's, a, I think these were cedar waxwings, a bunch of them nesting in these trees, uh, in these shrubs that we plant. Um, here's some of the hedgerows, you know, a couple of years ago as we we're grazing them. Uh, European pear and flower, that's probably an eight-year-old tree. Um, so next section here is cultivated, actually, like food plots you're growing for wildlife, which is a commonly known strategy for sure for just fast high value food um mr bear utilizes them uh the, the turnips and radish are primarily what we're sowing in here along with like a smattering of clovers um and the deer love it of course and they'll dig through all winter and basically give us like a grazing pass in the off season a manure just rooting up you know radish and turnip you can buy this stuff by the pound, stock seed farms and Hancock seed, yep. sell this stuff by the pound. You don't, you know, it's not buying like a little seed packet of, of, you know, radish. It's like tillage radish by the pound and you can get a massive amount of food uh, up with this stuff. And um, vegetable gardens, I'll uh, think this is the last section here. Um, just an unintentional yield, but it's food for everyone, and uh, frustratingly so, of course, for, for those of us who like to grow vegetables. So all of our vegetable gardens have been, you know, huge amount of food for deer, rodents, sometimes turkey, definitely birds. Um, and we, you know, we try to get a lot of the food out of it, but uh, we are also feeding wildlife quite intensively with, with these yields, because these are some of the most succulent things you can grow yeah. of course so there's a nice looking stretch of gardens from last year and um yeah we'll leave we'll let stuff go to seed for the birds and you'll know, kind of leave things in sometimes all winter and that helps that's a nice strategy for letting your vegetable garden be good for the wildlife so you're not fencing your 
gardens to keep them out. You're actually probably growing extra just to allow them to also feed as well. Yeah, we try to grow a little extra. Basically, we just let some stuff go and, and feed them, um, especially stuff, you know, that that wasn't the right timing for us or got woody, um, like kohlrabi or something we didn't harvest early enough. There's always the stuff you kind of swung and missed a little bit in terms of the exact timing or had a little too much of, and then we'll just leave it or let it go self-seed, you know, let it self-seed or um, let it be seed for birds in the fall or winter. Um, we find if you leave a, a vegetable garden with a bunch of food still in it, it usually is serving a lot of different wildlife, you know, that yeah. winter. Um, but we don't fence our garden. We would if we didn't have a dog and we had more deer. But we just don't. We have a dog and we don't have a lot of deer. So, gotcha. I mean, at some point, you know, the vegetable garden is our food. I'm not trying to grow most of it for the wildlife. Uh, but but it does end up being, you know, to a tolerable degree for wildlife right now. Yeah. yeah. In a lot of places, you definitely would have to just straight up fence it or you you would have nothing. You know, I would say more places than not, that's the case. So, um, and just a word about harvestability, as we keep managing for wildlife over the years, and we're moving more and more into like hunting and harvesting, um, there's a lot you can do on that front in terms of funneling deer and making sure the connections between cover and food and water sources are clear and easy to and you know easy for the animals to follow and then you can funnel them along those paths and away from other areas where you can um, set up to do your hunting and and be able to kind of reasonably get a bunch of food without a crazy time investment because hunting is a fantastic way to get food a very sustainable yield of food i think in a lot of the world but it it can be like an inordinate amount of time investment yeah. Um, I know some people are like, why would you go hunting? I can grow all this food in my garden for way less time. I'm sitting, you know, you guys are sitting in the woods for like day after day to get like a deer. Yeah. And now people love that. Don't get me wrong. But it can be either a crazy amount of time or a much less amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, you know, not to bash on, you know, the value of sitting in the woods at all. That's fantastic. But if, you know, if, if time is limiting, which yeah. it is always to some extent, um, it's something to think about. And some of us would just go crazy sitting in the woods for that long. So we need to be able to, in a couple hours, go out, get harvest the deer. Yeah. Then... Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I can't. I built a tree stand, and then I realized I couldn't sit in a tree stand for <laughs> as long as you really need to. Uh, so I still hunt, you know, like I'll walk, stop, stalk, walk, stop, you yeah. know, and which isn't terribly successful i mean if you want to get a deer sit in a stand above a food plot you know but you, you do sometimes have to sit for hours and hours and yeah. I, I just can't do it yeah I, it's too I much get better where i make sure that there's a food plot within sight of my deck or my uh my office so I right can see the deer and exactly just walk out and harvest it that's 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 how i'm trying to set everything up is like turkey apples within vis you know visible from yeah. your workspace where you are most of the time because you know i don't always have time to devote you know days to just waiting for you know the animal um yeah. and and being a lot more kind of efficient with that with that time management so um, i know some people might really frown on that because that's not the hunting experience but just from a food systems for experience um you know, I think that's much more practical for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that um, almost closes us out here. Just got a, a couple photos from the, from the harvestability. And one thing I'll mention is when I have harvested deer, usually I pick up roadkill uh, more than anything. Um, I will bring some of the deer that I can't use or don't have the time to fully process, you know, into you know, I'll sometimes keep the, the hides to, with the hopes of, of tanning them or giving them to friends who will. Um, I'll like remake them into raw hides so they can be used later on. Um, but I'll put some of the parts out to attract coyotes and sometimes bobcat to the fields to deter other deer away from our baby trees when we had more baby trees and also just to feed, to feed this wildlife. So yeah. this is an example of like feeding wildlife directly with straight up food. Yeah. Um, and not wildlife that we want to harvest, but we just want to promote predators because predators are important to actually having the prey. A lot of people don't understand that. And there's such a culture of killing coyotes in so much of the U.S., which is so, you know, kind of ill 
conceived of like they think there's no no coyotes then we'll have more deer and more and it just doesn't work that way yeah. um and so we actually want the the predators for not only the health of the land but for selfish reasons too and uh so they're they're pretty easy to feed sometimes when there's an abundance um some references i'd throw out there is a paper uh called spatial theory and early conservation design uh from Le leopold's work and um, Leopold's book that a lot of people don't know about because um, Sand County Almanac is his like main book that people really hear of where he talks about growing wildlife a bunch with, with and his whole Remis concept. And then a lot of land-grant universities have all sorts of white papers online you can Google and find instantly on improving wildlife habitat you know, on your property. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that was amazing. That was really cool because one of the things, you know, you think about is so many people when they start developing ground and land is they just start clearing everything, you know, cutting back the hedgerows, doing all this stuff, you know, trying to dry out the wet spots and don't think about the entire ecosystem mm. and then they lose all their wildlife and wonder why that happens. Mm -hmm. So thinking about bringing it back in just very strategic areas where you're actually saving a lot of work that you would be normally doing in these areas to push hog that area. Um, and being able to have a side product of free food. Yeah, definitely. There's there's a lot of underutilized spaces on, in these landscapes that we can stock with value. Mm -hmm. And actually make the land so much better. Because, you know, one of the things, we're in Ohio here, and so we see the massive cornfields and just how they till through every single um, swale and uh, you know every single hedgerow gets ripped out to make the fields bigger and what that ends up causing is much much more erosion mm. and just degradation of the landscape and if they would think about some of these principles there'd be huge advantages for everything um, and it'd save their soils yeah so. yep definitely it's a lot of win-win available to yep. us so you have the book out the resilient farm and homestead you also have a uh, land design company is that what you'd call that yeah mm -hmm. yep yep whole systems design and and the whole system design collective which is pretty so the latest version of of our company where we do our, our studio work out of yeah and uh we're 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 here to be a resource for folks who are trying to improve their land base mm -hmm. uh and we teach courses as a permaculture course every year as well and have some videos and other things out there Gotcha. You've got, you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram. And YouTube. YouTube I try to keep up with. Not so good lately, but I, I'll get back to it. Okay. All right. Very cool. We'll link all of those below so people can go and check you guys out there. So cool. Awesome. Thank great. you guys so much for your time today. Uh, this has been yeah a great resource. And again, it was always starting people's wheels in their brain, turning on just how they can add maybe just two or three of these strategies into their new farm site or their existing farm site. Mm-hmm. So, Great. Awesome. Well, thanks for coordinating all this, making it happen. All right. Thanks, Ben. All right. Have a good evening. All right. You too. Thanks. All right. Awesome. Well, I'm going to let you go because I know it's... Uh